Distinguished future physicians, welcome to Stomp on Step 1, the only free video series that helps you study more efficiently by focusing on the highest yield material. In this video, I'm going to be covering what I call the doctoring questions. Usually this is rolled in with biostats and ethics into one big chapter, but to me they're pretty distinct things, so I cover them separately. That being said, I really don't need a video on these doctoring questions. They're really gimme questions. They're so easy. A little common sense and you should be able to get all of them right without really breaking a sweat. But I wanted my video series to be comprehensive, so I figured one few minute video on the doctoring questions would be worthwhile. Now I should say I think doctoring in general is extremely important to medical school because it's really what ends up separating the mediocre doctors from the great ones, but it's really not emphasized in step one, and that's why part of the reason why the questions are so easy. So you should focus on this for just for your own training, but for step one, I wouldn't really spend much time on any of these topics. So I've made up a set of four rules that you can apply to these doctoring questions. Um, I'm calling them the fundamental four. And you can see here in the top right corner, I give this first rule a high yield rating of 10. For those of you who don't know what that is, it's a rating scale from zero to 10 that gives you a rough estimate for how often you're likely to apply a topic or principle to a step one question. If you'd like to learn more about that rating system, you can head to my website here. So the first one is anything that sounds the least bit rude, insensitive, or unprofessional should be ruled out right away. Again, this is something that sounds silly to even mention, but just using this rule usually helps you rule out at least a couple different options, which is crazy, but it's true. The next one is any option that includes referring your patient to somebody else, some sort of ethical consult, some sort of specialist, anything like that is going to be wrong. For all of these questions, they expect you to be able to solve the problem yourself. So referring to somebody else, just passing the buck is not going to be the correct answer. The third one is don't jump straight to any diagnostic tests, treatments, surgeries, anything like that before you have the full picture. So get a comprehensive history before you start jumping into that sort of stuff. In these questions, you're all often going to see a answer choice that sounds something like, tell me more about blank, or why do you feel that way about blank, or what do you think's going on? These open-ended questions, just getting more information, when you see those, those are almost always the correct answer. If they've only given you a couple sentence history, that's not comprehensive enough to make any treatment decisions on. So the correct answer is trying to find out more about what's going on. And then finally, any statements centered on the physician are wrong. So say you're doing a question about religious beliefs or cultural beliefs, don't roll in what you think about it. Everything needs to be patient centered. Same thing goes for if you're tired or had a long day, anything like, anything like that. It's not appropriate to mention that to the patient. Everything's got to be about the patient. We want to be patient-centered, not physician-centered. Now that we've gotten through those few principles that can be applied to most questions, we can get into a couple specific scenarios that tend to show up on step one. The first one is some sort of scenario where the patient is emotional. They're scared, they're worried, they're angry about something that's been wrong. So here are the do's and don'ts for this situation. So you do want to acknowledge the patient's feelings and empathize with them if it's appropriate. You do want to ask what is upsetting them or what has them worried. You don't want to assume you know what's going on. If you or one of your staff made a mistake, you want to apologize for that mistake. Don't tell the patient to calm down or stop worrying. Don't just ignore the patient's feelings and don't blame any mistakes or problems on some other team member or some other healthcare provider. Another scenario you might see is a non-compliant patient who's not taking the medication you prescribed to them or maybe didn't go get the lab test you asked them to, maybe they're not doing the lifestyle changes like diet, exercise, that kind of thing. So these types of questions asks how, how you react to those situations. So again, here are the do's and don'ts. You do want to ask the patient why they did not or could not follow the treatment plan. There may be some sort of barrier that prevented them from doing what you asked, and you need to figure that out. You can't jump straight to 
sort of solving the problem before you know what's going on. So you need to figure out what stopped them. It could be a transportation issue. It could be a money issue, something like that. And you need to collect more information on that to move forward. Asking the patient what their understanding of that prescribed treatment plan is, is also important. Maybe they didn't follow through on it because they didn't understand how important it was. Maybe they misunderstood the directions themselves. Maybe they didn't take the drug every day because they thought it was only supposed to be taken every other day or something like that. Another good option for any non-compliant situation is just to give the patient more information about the treatment plan and to fix or address any misconceptions they might have. The better understanding they have of why you're asking them to do a certain thing, the more likely they are going to be to follow that. So some of the don'ts are don't blame the patient or get angry at the patient for not following the treatment plan. Don't adjust the treatment plan based solely on one case of non-compliance. So for example, if you're asking somebody to lose weight and after a couple months they haven't lost any weight, you don't jump straight to some sort of surgical or medication treatment. You work with them and try to get the lifestyle changes to work a little bit better the second time around. Don't make any assumptions on lack of competence or try to base any sort of psych psychiatric diagnosis solely on non-compliance. A huge percentage of patients are non-compliant overall. So just because somebody is not being compliant does not mean they have one of these problems. And finally, don't threaten the patient with any sort of consequences if they don't follow the treatment plan. Telling somebody they're going to die if they don't do exactly what you tell them to is not a good way to go about it. So overall, just be more understanding of patients who aren't being non-compliant because a lot of times non-compliance is the fault of all ourselves not explaining something correctly or some sort of barrier to receiving the treatment plan that's out of the patient's control. Next we have motivational interviewing. This would be a patient who's maybe an alcoholic or addicted to smoking and you're trying to help them th get through that addiction. So you do want to gauge how important quitting is to the patient. You need to know how dedicated they are to the change because if they're not ready for it, it's not going to work. You want to ask the patient what they know about the subject rather than spouting out statistics and facts at them. If they, you can figure out what sort of things are important to them and how much they already know if you're giving them a chance to speak about it. You want to ask the patient about past attempts they've used and other roadblocks that they've run into or think they're going to run into and ask patients about any concerns they have about the lifestyle change. I already mentioned you don't want to just spout out facts to them. They've probably heard all that stuff before and it's not very effective. And again, don't threaten patients with negative, consequ negative consequences of not following your proposed lifestyle change. And there are going to be some questions related to religious or cultural differences. So you always want to be respectful of the patient's beliefs, even if they're different than your own. You do want to acknowledge the importance of these beliefs to the patients. And you should allow patients to seek alternative remedies or home remedies as long as it's not going to interfere with the treatment plan you're prescribing. You don't want to base any psychiatric or neurologic diagnoses based on something that could be a religious belief or a cultural practice. And you shouldn't feel obligated to participate in any of the patient's religious or cultural practices if you don't feel comfortable. So if you're not religious and the patient asks you to pray with them, you don't have to do that if you don't feel comfortable doing it. And finally, you might see situations where the family is in the exam room. So in these situations, you do want to ask the family members to leave the room, especially if they are answering the questions themselves and not letting the patient speak. You do want to ask parents of teenage patients to leave the room for at least part of the history and physical so you can get more honest answers about certain things. And you do want to ask the patient in private if they want the patients there because you shouldn't be asking the patient with all their family members right next to them, hey, do you want your family there? Because you might not get a true answer then. They don't want to say it right in front of their family. And talking to the patients in private is especially important if there are any signs that there could be potential abuse or neglect.